What's up, everybody, and welcome to your Reason to Like Wednesdays. As always, my partners and I are here to bring you what's working in SEO and mark to, in market to answer your question. What's working online? Whatever it is that's working, that's what we're going to answer questions on. Whatever's not working for you, we'll, hopefully we'll uh, work it out. And as you can see, probably, if you're watching this live, we have a new, and even if you're watching it on replay, we have a new person joining us today. It's hey. my pleasure to introduce Essie to all of you. She is the person who has been working with Bradley and me behind the scenes so that we can bring you the new and improved Syndication Academy. So Essie, say hello to the world. Tell them who you are, where you're from, all that good stuff. Let them know who you are. <laughs> Okay, hello everyone. I'm a bit excited, so I will need to apologize for any typo that I might make. Typo, if I can call it. So while I speak, I'm not an English native speaker. Uh, I've been working with um, Syndication Academy 3.0 that will be released hopefully soon. Actually, later than we thought it would in the beginning, but uh, it is taking a bit longer. However, it will be soon uh, available. Um, Marco says, I'm going to replace Bradley, but I, I, I'll, of course, only replace him as a number. I cannot possibly replace Bradley as a character. Uh, so to introduce myself a little bit, I am a 28-year-old uh, Albanian girl. Well, 28 in two days, actually. <laughs> and uh, I'm really new in this all SEO thing. My name is Essie, but I'm, I don't know much about it. I'm, I'm starting, I'm learning. I've been learning the uh, for the couple of three months I've been working with it. And uh, in a way, uh, it will probably be relatable to you since what I'm learning is new for me as well. So I will try to explain it in the way that I understand it. So you will be able to understand it even better uh, than you would from a professional person like Bradley, uh, because he knows uh, all the terminology, while for a beginner, it might be a bit uh, difficult. So um, I really hope you guys will enjoy the final uh, uh, result results. <laughs> well, happy birthday. Thank you. In two days, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Happy early birthday. And thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. I know you've been hard at work. People don't see what you're doing, but you know, we, we, we keep track. We see what you're doing. We're trying to help you out. And I'm glad you mentioned that because the reason why we went and got you is because you had no idea what SEO was. And so <laughs> you no, listen, if you can go through the training, apply it and show people how it works and make it work then there's no reason why anyone else can't take the same training and do exactly what you did. So thank you. And just hang out in case anybody has, has any questions or whatever, or just hang out with us for, for the rest yeah. of the hour. You're welcome to stay. And thank as you. I see you on my screen from left to right, I'm going to go th uh, through the rest of my partners. Let them say hello. Chris, what's up, man? Hey, hey. doing good here. Um... Yeah, excited for all the Black Friday stuff that is upcoming, but I'm pretty sure we'll talk about it in a bit. So, yeah. Thanks, man. Bradley, man, I see you next. What's up? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm good. It's, you know, Thanksgiving tomorrow. I'm looking forward to that. It's like my favorite holiday because the food is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've got, we always kind of get together with family. I'm uh, a big, my, my, my sister and her in-laws, uh, or my in-laws, I should say, um, we always go out to their house and they have some huge spread and it's it's amazing. So I'm really looking forward to that. But uh, just a quick note, SE SEO. I could see that being a brand, <laughs> SE SEO. <laughs> yeah, you so, could probably change the name now that I'm in. Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. It just kind of worked out that way. So anyways, glad to have you. Uh, welcome to Thank our uh, Hump Day Hangouts and look forward to um, seeing what the Syndication Academy update version three looks like when it comes out. So, you know, I'll be working closely with you over the next several weeks or a couple of months really, or whatever to get it, um, get it finalized. But um, so far it's been good. Thank, so thank you so much. And then I see that somebody let her Nam back in. Yeah, man. Up, man? <laughs> you guys shouldn't, you guys shouldn't. <laughs> What's happening everybody. Thank you, Marco, for seeing. Thank you, Essie, for being here. It's excited to have you on the team. Thank you, everybody yeah. that's watching this live and everyone that's watching the recording as well. And uh, yeah, excited for what's coming up for Black Friday. So really excited to see how that comes out. So that's, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned that because anyone who's on our list already has Black, Black, uh, Black Friday available. 
And so they got an early start on the holiday. So guys, if you're on our list, check for that mail, check your spam, make sure it didn't go in there. Make sure you got us whitelisted in case you got another email coming because we're going to have goodies all through the weekend and on Monday, maybe extended a little bit more. It, it, it depends. You know, you know how we do the do guys. And as you can see, I'm still it's groundhog day. I can't help it, man. I it, like it's the volcano. It's the, it's the price I pay for the life I live. What can I say, man? I, you know, somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to do it. And so with that, guys, let's go to the questions, Bradley. Okay, cool. Uh, let me grab the screen. Stand by one moment. We got it. All right, you all are seeing my screen, correct? Yep, we're good. All right. Not a whole lot of questions, but it is the day before Thanksgiving, so I'm not surprised. Uh, if we get done with questions early, guys, we'll just wrap it up early. Um, I'm sure everybody's looking forward to – apparently the night before Thanksgiving is one of the biggest drinking days in the U.S., <laughs> So I can imagine a bunch of people are going to go get hammered anyway. So <laughs> anyway, starting with uh, Ivan, he says, hi, SM crew. When it comes to boosting properties like the MGYB short links, along with the G site organization, PR page and other citations and assets, is there such a thing as too many links? My thought was that if everyone is building tiered links, it will devalue the sites over time. Uh, Marco, I think that's a great one for you. What do you think? Is there so such a thing as too many links? We're about to find out. I, I built software, and I, I just broke it today at, at creating one one plus three hundred and three hundred and sixteen zeros links. That was the limit. I ran into the sixty four bit limit on on a PC, and so I'll have to rework that. But we're, we're about to find out what Google's limit is as far as links, and when we we can come back and talk about it. From what I'm seeing. And we've done, of course, you know about the million link test on, on DC Plumber. And then you know how Keith Mallinson earlier this year came in and he mentioned his test, his million link test. Then uh, I ran another million link test. And then Rob came in with, with 10 million. Like, and we're, we're talking pure spam, right? Yeah. It's any type of link building that you do is, is spam because you're not supposed to be building links. And it just seems that the more you give Google, the merrier. Here's, here's what I found. When Google tells you not to do something, you have to go find out why. They tell you, don't, don't do this. So, so you got to go, why are they telling me not to spam? And then you come to find out because it works really well. Now, the whole point is don't get caught. Because if you get caught, you, you get smacked down. So if, if link building works, then it stands to reason by logic if we do more of those links that work, then it's going to work even better. What the threshold is would be, for example, if you start out ranking a website like Amazon for the keyword Amazon, they're going to come and bitch and moan, then they're going to come and look at why you're out ranking Amazon for the keyword Amazon. And then that's, that's your problem. But as far as I know, and as far as I understand how it all works, Building links is alive and well. Tiered link building works even better. It's, it works phenomenally well. Iframes plus link building is killing it. So the, the, the keyword in all of that is link building. Now, Ivan, take that with, with, with a grain of salt. I'm not saying for you to go out and order 100 million GSA links from Fiverr. Because if you aim those straight at your website, you're going to kill yourself. You're going to choke yourself off. It's just totally unnatural for your website to receive those. What we do is we filter them and we don't work, like people get really anal about, about indexing. Like we don't care if we want, if we do 10 million links, we know that a portion of those are going to index naturally. Another portion of those are going to get indexed by Dedia and another portion will just end up in, in whatever digital space things end up in. We don't care. We know what the effect is going to be not only of those, but the ones that we build up behind those over time. I, here's, here's my thought. Yes, everyone is building tiered things for a reason. And they're working for a reason. What we're doing is we build PageRank into the ranking score algorithm, and then it's the art of art that takes over, activity, relevance, trust, and authority that makes everything work. Absent any of these things, 
and you could have problems if you incur a manual. But when you look at your little dinky website, in the website, and I say dinky, you could be making a couple of million, which is nothing on the web. And nobody's going to pay attention to you. It, it, unless, you know, just it, it's just one of those random things where it pops up and you get on the list of people to be looked at manually. But think of the millions of websites that are on that list for manuals to, to, to get a, a look at by a person so that they can tell what it is that you're doing. If, if you're good enough at hiding shit, if you're good enough at filtering, it won't go past that. It won't go, oh, I don't see anything wrong here. The guy just did what he's supposed to be doing. More power to you. Bradley, in all honesty, I don't see any issues with link building right now unless you get caught link building. Yeah. Which, by the way, I just have to give you a, uh, a shout out, Marco, because I started watching the uh, most recent Heavy Hitter Club webinar last evening. I got to about 46 minutes before I ended up pausing it and uh, I've got to finish watching it, but it was damn good. So anyways, a very, very good webinar talking about you know, what you talked about in it. And um, so I would encourage people that are looking to get the best kind of results from what we talk about. Like the heavy hitter club is insane. Uh, Marco and Rob are just, it's just crazy what you guys give away in there. It's um, it's insane. So uh, just wanted to give you a shout out for that. All right. Next question is from Christian says question for Marco. Another one. What's the best way to build links to pass the most value across the entire domain? Read somewhere about link building to the XML sitemap, but this seems unnatural. Yeah, and I wouldn't recommend that either because link building in the XML sitemap is directly linking to your domain. Um, I mean, if you're, I wouldn't, we wouldn't recommend that. I know I wouldn't, <laughs> but this seems a natural. Would love any opinions on this. Thanks. So, Margaret, what do you say on that? It can have great effect because you're building links directly to all of the links on your website. The problem is that you're building links directly to your website and to right. all of the links on your website. What we would do is we would take that XML sitemap and iframe it on a G site, of course, and link built to, to the G site. You know, that's something I've never Problem done. Problem solved. I've never done that. I framed a, a site map. Yeah. I'll be damned. Can't believe oh, I'm giving so much that. away. Huh? Shh. I didn't say that. <laughs> I'm gonna have to test that. I'm, I didn't even no. thought to do that, man. <laughs> never mind. But yeah, dude, we do everything through the power shield. Everything that we do is done through the SEO power shield. And so why wouldn't we go and put that on the shield, hmm. right? So now we're shielding ourselves off from incurring a penalty because it's an iframe. Iframes don't pass penalties. And then you bang it. <laughs> you know, you get dead yet. Uh, that just set a, set a bunch of thoughts off in my head. I know. But, I know. Uh, there's category site maps, post site maps, tag site maps. There's video site maps, image image site maps. There's all kinds of stuff you could do with those if you can iframe site maps. And I never even thought about that. That's insane. It's, uh, it's not it. Too much. <laughs> Keep it a secret. Don't tell anyone, yeah. right? Don't tell anyone publicly. <laughs> Abdul's up next. For those starting an SEO agency, what are some good tips to get consistent leads? Tried LinkedIn and some video audits with zero success so far along with Upwork? Uh, I would recommend video email, um, video lead gen system. There's a few different ways that like our, our product called video lead gen system is a method that I've used to land clients. Uh, I started, I really developed the first version of it that I used for many years, uh, way back in 2012. Um, that was very time intensive. It was very effective. I was getting consistently a 35% response rate on cold emails, um, but it was very slow. So in other words, like I would, I would always do them video emails in batches of 10 and I would get on every single time I would do a, a, a prospecting campaign with a batch of 10 video emails that were customized for each recipient. I would get either three or four responses right? And out of those three or four, I would typically close at least one, but sometimes two, uh, two of those responses into some sort of retainer model or lead generation. Uh, you know, they would become lead buyers or whatever it was that I was, I was approaching them for. So that's why I say 35%, because every time I did 10, it would either be three or four responses. Um, about two years ago, I updated video lead gen system to make it more to, to and basically added another module that talks about how to streamline the process a lot better. 
um, to make it way more efficient. And you can use a VA for a lot of it to where you can just record, you know, what's called a common uh, a common section or common video, like like there's going to be a, a big portion of the video is going to be common to all of the recipients. And it's just the intro that is unique to each recipient. So the intro can be very short, like 90 seconds or less. So that therefore you can literally record a whole bunch of intros to unique to each recipient in very, very short period of time. And then have a VA do all the other work, the splicing of the intro to the common video and then even do the emailing and everything else. And all of that process is taught in video lead gen system. Um, more recently, the POFU Live 2020, uh, our, so our live event, POFU Live 2020, so our live event from this year, I did a um, another prospecting training on setting up what I call a prospecting machine. It's using the high level platform. It's freaking fabulous. Um, I've been able to use cold emails, not even video emails, but just straight cold emails and get a 30% response rate, which is insane for cold prospecting. Um, and it works really, really well. And I taught that specific method, including all the process docs on how to build that out in high level and everything is part of my POFU Live presentation, which is available in the POFU Live 2020 recordings. So those are the two products that I would recommend uh, that you uh, check out because that's exactly how I prospect. And I do a lot of prospecting. I've, more recently, it's been for lead buyers for my lead gen assets. Uh, you know, I've got a bunch of leads coming in that I needed to monetize. So I, I've been doing it for lead generation. But in about uh, probably right after the first of the year, I'm going to be going really heavy on prospecting for some activity-based services for tree service contact contractors, not doing like full on SEO and everything else, but like doing like GMB posts and video ads. I'm getting really heavy in the YouTube ads for local right now. And that's a service that I want to provide. So it'll be kind of like a lesser expensive service. So I'm going to be doing a ton of prospecting and I'm going to kind of repurpose the high level prospecting machine for that. And that will be updated and added to the POFU live recordings. Uh, and again, that's, I'm probably gonna wait till January to start really prospecting heavy for that. But I'm just telling you that because both of those products have been very successful or like those methods, excuse me, have been very successful for my own business, my own agency, my own lead generation business. So I would highly recommend that you check those out and know that uh, it's going to be updated once again in um, January, the POFU live recordings anyways, and maybe video lead gen system um, as well with the, uh, you know, with my results from my new prospecting campaign that I'm going to commence with on in January. So Anybody else want to talk about? Yeah, I, I tried link, LinkedIn and I'm surprised that, that he had zero success. Uh, well, was it free or was it, Abdul, I need to know if, if you tried the, the paid or, or the free LinkedIn. Because through, through the paid, like you, you'll get notified when there are leads available in the area you choose. You mean and, like ProFinder? Pro yeah. LinkedIn ProFinder? LinkedIn yeah. ProFinder. Yeah, but, but here's, here's the interesting part. Like you can change the areas. You can change. Like I, I was doing Virginia because we had a, I, I had a phone number. Then I went and got a phone number in, in, in New York and I changed it and I changed the area. And I got leads uh, uh, from New York. And it was really interesting because you're supposed to submit a bid. But I, what I would do is, hey, you know, let's set up a call. Let's, let's do a call so that I can properly go over what your needs are. So I would get them on, on the call. And, and once you get them on the call and they see who you are, what you do, and you, and you show them, here's the, the most important part of anything that you're doing is you have to be able to show that you can do what you say you're going to do. Yeah. You can't just tell them, this is what I'm going to do for you. And then you have nothing backing up what, what you're saying. Like I could take them through clients and, and all of these different things that I have to show, this is what I can do for you. Give me 90 days. And at the end of those 90 days, then we'll discuss what my fee is going to be because it's never, it's never going to be as, as low as those first 90 days. That's right. But I'm really surprised seeing that the, the zero success. So maybe we, we should do something with that LinkedIn pro finder. I don't know. So something to think about. I don't have time to do it. But when yeah, I yeah. tried it, I, I, I did have success. So that's just a couple other things came to mind as Marco was talking and, um, you know, there's the old tried and true method of going to like local meetups, um, lead share groups, that kind of stuff. You can go to meetup.com and 
I mean, I'm assuming if, if you're in the US, you can go to meetup.com and you can probably find the local lead sharing groups, uh, your chamber of commerce, uh, local chamber of commerce, like that, that in-person networking, it works. You can get local clients that way. Um, I prefer to stick with a, within a particular industry now, which is the tree service industry or, or tangent industries like you know, land clearing, perhaps landscaping, you know, some other things like that, but primarily tree service stuff. And um, so because of that, I can't stick to just local areas. Uh, so, you know, I've developed my own method, which I talked about the video lead gen systems that works really, really well. Um, but something else would be like using, you know, inbound marketing from, you know, ads, you, you set up your own. And I talk, we talk about this in 2X your agency as well. Um, the, the full, the first part, 2X your agency.com. If you go there, you can, you can check out our training for 2X your agency. Um, but we talk about, there's three parts to that. There's the pipeline, there's the results and then, and then growth or scaling. So in other words, that, that whole training is divided up into three sections. The first section being completely about filling your pipeline as an agency. That's the most important thing. Um, you know, if what we hear are too many times with people coming into like semantic mastery mastermind, for example, is they come in and they say, you know, we get this often too, that client getting, Landing new clients is the hardest thing for their agency the, or the, the biggest obstacle to growth. And whenever we get on our, um, you know, mastermind new member, our new mastermind member calls, because we always do, you know, a 30 minute call with new members. One of the questions that I often ask is, you know, well, what are you doing for prospecting? You know, are you filling your pipeline with prospects? And it's, it's very poor. Most of the results are like, it, it, most people just aren't prospecting consistently. They prospect when they need some clients, they go through, a week or two of heavy prospecting, they get some leads coming in, then they work those leads and they, they stop prospecting while they work those leads. And then hopefully they get a client out of it. Uh, and then they got to start that process all over again. A lot of the times, once they get a client, instead of prospecting throughout, you know, while they're working the leads, they stop prospecting. And then once they land the client, they go through the onboarding process with the client. And so they, they don't prospect during that time either. So once they finally get the client up to a part where they their time is freed up a little bit to where they can go back to prospecting and to start it again. So it's always peaks and valleys, right? Peaks and valleys. And that's really not the way to do it. Prospect consistently so that you always have a pipeline full of prospects so that whenever you, uh, you know, that, that's one, a couple of things happens when you have a pipeline full of prospects. Number one, you don't, it's not as critical to close every prospect that you're talking to. And desperation comes through, guys, like people can smell desperation from, you know, across the globe. <laughs> and what I'm saying is if you are desperate to close a sale with a prospect that you're talking to because it's the only prospect you have, um, that comes through and people can detect that or, or pick up on that. And so, uh, and I think that kills conversion rates, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, and I know because I've, I've been there. Um, something else is when you have a you know, a pipeline full of prospects, you can cherry pick and only work with those that seem to be the best fit, the ones that you're most comfortable with through communication and everything else. Whereas when you only have a handful of prospects, again, you cling to those prospects and try to make the deal happen, even if you know it's not a good fit. Once again, how do I know this? Because I've been there. And every time that I've done that, and I've taken on a client for money's sake, but I felt like in my gut, you know, I had this gut feeling that it wasn't a good fit it turned out to be, that turned out to be the case. Like it, it, it's a nightmare engagement. Um, it's a pain in the ass to deal with. It causes a lot of stress and it's the, the money's just not worth it. And so again, having a pipeline full of prospects is incredibly important. So when I say inbound marketing, again, go check out two extra agencies, very inexpensive, but there's a ton of training in there on how to fill your pipeline. One thing I recommend is branding yourself, you know, um, or your agency, however you want to do it. I think a personal brand is a little bit better than a corporate brand. It gets better results in it from, from my experience. Um, but do things like YouTube ads, guys. Like YouTube ads are so incredibly inexpensive right now, especially it's insane. You can get a ton of reach. Uh, targeting options have gotten incredibly good. You can create custom audiences now. So you can literally create a bucket of people that are interested in, uh, you, you know, a bucket of prospects essentially that you can market to on YouTube and display network. Those are all inexpensive ways to get, to be brand, to brand yourself and bring, um, create exposure to your ideal prospect. So I would highly recommend that. And Hernan, I know you've got a ton of really good, um, prospecting advice too. What can, what can you give? 
Turn on. Sorry, I was talking to a mute mic. Oh, there you um, go. I think that one of uh, in two X your agency, we actually have a full module, uh, which is which was one of my presentations for Pofo Life twenty eighteen, and I kind of expand that last year, but it was about uh, the Eagle method, right? And on that method, like which is explained by the way in two X your agency, um, I walk you through step by step on how to create a personal brand and how to create content that people um, come in and consume so that you don't have to go out there and do any, pretty much any of the heavy lifting because you're putting together those systems so that people will reach out to you, right? So you're, you're not depending that much on referrals. Referrals are great, but they're not consistent. So if you put a system like that where you're putting out content and you're advertising that content, that uh, helps you um, you know, getting features and experts. So in 2X, your agency, it's everything, um, you know, everything is explained step by step. So, you know, Bradley has a more like a outbound approach. I have a more like inbound approach. And if you combine the two of them, you can grow up uh, an agency pretty quickly. So that's what I would say. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, somebody's posting questions and doesn't realize, I guess maybe they came to the page before the uh, video up, updated, so I don't know if she's even going to see, or Orig is even going to hear our, our responses, but we'll get to that in a moment. All right, so the next question is, where am I? I lost it. Okay, BB. BB. BB's up. <laughs> uh, what's up, BB? Uh, he says, should I delete the person schema when there is organization schema? It depends. Um, like, what... And it depends on where, like how the schema is being used on what type of, in which situation, like what is, what are you marking up? For example, if it's like blog, blog, you know, article markup for a blog post or a news release or whatever, um, you know, it depends. Like are, are, there's, there's a section for the author and in a section for the publisher. And if the author, if you want to designate a person and you have your schema connected properly, right, it's called nested schema or connected data items or there's a, no, there's a num number of terms for it, but if you have it connected correctly, then you would list the author, which would have person schema for the author, if, if you want to do it that way. And then the publisher as the organization, which is organization schema, and all of that is nested correctly. Um, and again, it's just, it depends on what you're doing. M most of the time for the articles that I mark up, I'm using the organization as the publisher and the author. So I don't use person schema. Um, but it depends. Again, if you're, if you're branding a person, a professional, for example, then you might want to use their person schema. So it, 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 the standard SEO question without more context or the standard SEO answer, excuse me, without more context is always, it depends. It depends on the situation, what you're marking up. Um, I know BB from your question last week, if you're not connecting the schema correctly, then you can ambiguate the main entity of the page to begin with. So you gotta be real careful about, you know, if you're using schema and you're marking things up that you do it in the proper way um, having different, you know, sex, different schema types on a page, but not nested correctly or connected properly um, can actually create issues, right? So it can confuse the bot. And that's what you don't want to do. And I was doing that wrong for quite some time. I'm not going to lie. I just recently started learning about how to do it correctly, thanks to Rob and the POFU Live um, training. So, but I would say, yeah, it's just really going to depend. Marco, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, parent, child, you, you're always going to have a, a, an organization that's full of people. And these people are each going to have some kind of whatever it is you want to call it or whatever the job is, whatever the position is inside the organization. And if that's the case, and if you want to, I mean, go, go into that much detail, you can. So, so you should have person schema within the organization schema. What is their job? What is their function within the organization schema that you're building? And if, if there is no place for a person to be used within that organization schema, then don't try to push that in just because you want a person schema within the organization schema. So as Bradley said, it depends on what function that person has within the organization, or I'll say again, the parent-child relationship. And then if it's on a page, what that person's relationship to that page is within also the organization. Yeah. So question number two is how to convince someone that does paid ads, Gmail, YouTube, search ads, and little content marketing and backlinks to add new source of some site and get the leads through a new source. Yeah, I, I get the question. 
Okay. I don't know what he's saying. Can you so interpret he, it? Yeah, well, yeah. He, all right. So he knows someone is doing ads. He wants to tell this person, hey, look, there's another way for you to get leads other than what you're doing. This new source, this, this online marketing thing where you can go get organic and you can get into maps. You can get leads that way. He wants to know how do I convince this person who only does ads to try something else. Yeah, it looks like he's also talking about if you provide, if you have leads that you can sell to somebody that's already doing ads too. I think that's the way I'm interpreting it as well. Um, hey, that's a great, you know, BB, you should go watch the Lead Simplify webinar that we did. Uh, I think it's, I think it's manatmastery.com slash Lead Simplify. But anyways, you should go watch that webinar because um, Mike Martin talks about the hybrid lead generation model. And, you know, I've got clients that I do that are retainer based clients or so traditional clients, right? You know, they, they pay me a monthly retainer and I optimize their assets. But if I happen to have lead generation assets that, you know, provide in, in their area that's within their service area that I, uh, you know, generate leads for, sometimes clients will even ask like, hey, you know, I'll, I'll buy leads from you too. So it's not that you need to convince anybody. Remember, if you're trying to convince somebody that they need your service, you're talking to the wrong damn person. Like you, that's the thing because you're, then you're trying to do two sales, right? You're trying to sell them the idea that they need what you have. And then you have to sell them that you're the one that provide that service, right? So you got to sell them twice. And, and that's, that's, a, that's very, very difficult. And I don't recommend it. And that's, again, going back to the question we had earlier about filling your pipeline full of prospects. If you have a pipeline full of prospects and you talk to 10 of them and six of them, you're trying to sell them on the need for what it is that you provide, like th that they, you have to sell them that they need that to be first before you can sell them on you providing that. Then like those are six people that you can disqualify very quickly, right? Because you're, you're saying, you know what, you're not the best fit for me. Not, not that I'm not the best fit for you. You're not the best fit for me because you're not already, you don't already know that this is good for your business. And I'm not saying don't try to educate people, but when you start to catch resistance from that, again, you have to sell them twice. In my opinion, it's the wrong type of prospect. And that's where, again, having a pipeline full of prospects is good. Doing inbound marketing. Inbound marketing is great because people have been exposed to you or your service or what you can provide, the results you can provide. Um, before they contact you. So remember an inbound lead, somebody already is aware of what it is that you do and they're interested in you giving them a proposal or at least having a conversation with them, right? So you only got to make the sale one time as opposed to twice. So again, it comes back to, uh, you know, who you're talking to. So when it comes to like, for example, I've got a, you know, I recently got a newer client in uh, Fort Lauderdale area of Florida. And in our initial conversation when we were, you know, during the proposal process, right? When I was prospect, when they were just a prospect and we were, you know, I was talking with them, uh, we did the discovery call, like I always do. All this is covered in 2X your A, uh, 2X your agency. Um, but I did a discovery call with them. And, and, and during that discovery call, I, I mentioned to them, by the way, I also do tree service lead generation. If you're interested, I, while I'm working on developing your assets and your brand, building your presence online, I could also build some lead gen assets in your area that will be generically branded. Uh, but the leads that come in, I can sell to you. And they said, yeah, that would be great. So they were interested in both a retainer and a lead generation business model, like a hybrid of the two. And so that's why I'm saying, you know, again, it, some people are going to be really open to that, or some business owners are going to be really open to that. And some aren't. And the ones that aren't, just don't bother. Don't waste your time. Go find some that are. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I see two things here. And, and I always like, like to talk about like, like my personal experience on, on things like this. Because I talked to someone not, not too long ago who was doing about $50 million a year on ads, ad spend, right? So it's a little bit over $4 million a month. And the guy was convinced that there was no other way to make money online than to do ads. Because he was getting a three-to-one return. On, you can imagine how much he's doing a year, right? If he's getting a three to one wow. return on what he's doing. So he's, he's making about a hundred million. And so when you get a person like that and they want to talk to you, but they're convinced that they're already doing what they're supposed to be doing. Like, but probably does it. I have to, if I talk to him, I have to convince him 
that there that there's another way. So so first I have to convince him that there's another way. Then I have to convince him or show him that my way works. And I have to be able to show him how my way works. So, so you get into a, a, a multiple step thing where any step of the way, you're going to run into a whole bunch of objections. The conversation gets heavy and it doesn't make sense because at the end, he's still going to be convinced that he's doing it the right way and that your way might not work no matter how much you show him. The, you have to find someone who's open to the idea, first and foremost, who isn't already convinced that they're doing it and that there's no other way. And then this goes back to what I was saying before. It all depends on whether you're able to show the results that you can get. You, look, man, you get, in fr- you get me in front of anyone, any, and I mean anyone, and nine out of ten, I'm going to close that person because I can take them through a whole lot of shit that I've done. And, 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 and I'm going to give them a 90 day out. So there's really no reason to say no, unless they were already looking to say no, because they're at least going to take that 90 day out. Look, 90 days at the end of those 90 days, we'll see. Cause then, then it comes six months and every six months I look it over. Cause I always want to leave an opening to fire the client, no matter how much money we're making. I, w- I always want that opening cause I get tired of people, but this all comes from you being able to show this person this is what I can do. These are the types of, types of results that I can get. This is what I can do for you. Now, when you're speaking, when you're speaking results, you're speaking money. And if this person is any type of business person, they're absolutely going to see the numbers, man. And so you, it doesn't even get to a hard close because there were, by the time you get to when do we start, it's already, yeah, like just bill me. Invoice, send me the invoice, or I'll cut you the check. If it's person to person, like it sometimes is, they just cut you the check. It gets really good, but you have to get to the point where the person's open, first and foremost, and where, where, where it, you can deliver the goods. Because if, if you guys can't, then you have to start figuring out how. Maybe your own leads, and like I see maybe BB, BB's doing, and show those, look, I want to get these over to you. Person should be able to say, the person should be able to see profit in your conversation you have to get them into that mindset rather than you trying to convince them that you can do what you say you can do yeah if you've got leads already for that particular industry uh for that business owner you mentioned baby then you know why not send them you know a couple of leads uh i do five i do a tree leads trial is what i call it it's a tree leads trial for tree service contractors and i allow them uh, I make them get on the phone with me. It's a brief conversation. It takes literally five minutes, uh, but it's just so that I can have a quick conversation with them to make sure that they can speak English, you know, or, or speak clearly, I should say, communicate well. If they're, you know, if they're really terrible, I don't want to send them to leads that were, gen- you know, to go, prov- you know, to customers' homes for leads that I generated anyway. So I, I require a phone call, but it only takes a couple of minutes and I add them to my lead simplify system, which does the lead distribution for me. And I give them five leads uh, for free. And then I tell, I tell them, look, once the fifth lead has been delivered, I'm going to call you again to discuss continuing the service. And that's, that's how I do it. Because a lot of the times people say, you know, like the guys, uh, the contractors that I talk to will say, you know, well, I bought leads before and they were shit. You know, I'm not sure that. I, and I just tell them, look, I'm going to give you five. No harm, no foul. You don't want them after that. That's, it's not going to hurt. Why not take five free jobs? And the reason I do that is because I tell them, look, my, my goal is that you get you close at least one job out of the five leads that I send you. And if you're any good at all at closing, you ought to be able to close at least one job, right? Out of the five leads that I sell you. That means you're going to make some money. And once you've made some money from the free lead that I sent you, you can reinvest that money in purchasing leads from me. Um, go, you know, I hope that you spend that money purchasing leads from me. So it's, it's my way of like earning their trust. And so I, I, you know, for me, that works really, really well. So instead of trying to convince them, I just tell them flat out, look, I'm not here to convince you or sell you on anything right now. I just want to get your verify your information so I can send you five leads. What you do with those leads is up to you. Uh, at the end of those, I'm going to give you a call back and see if you want to continue the service, at which point I'm going to ask for money. Is that fair? That's what I say. And it's a very short, brief conversation, and it tends to work well. So, okay, moving on. Next question is from Blake SEO. He says, hey, guys, question about local Viking. They claim that this tool keeps exit data on the images and it doesn't get stripped because they use the Google API. Is this possible or do you think it gets stripped anyways? I don't know. Um, I can't speak for local Viking or really what Google does. Um, you know, people say that 
it strips the exit data when you upload a video or a, a or an image or a video to Google My Business anyway. Um, but you know when when you if you upload an image with exit data to, to Google My Business and then you once it's uploaded you go download it from Google. Yes, the exit data has been stripped. But does that mean that Google didn't see that exit data when you uploaded the video? Does that does that make sense? So I, I don't I don't know whether the Google API strips it or not. Maybe Marco does. But in my opinion, does it really matter if, if when you upload the video, that data gets, you know, Google sees that data when the image gets uploaded originally? Um, what do you say, Marco? Well, first and foremost, what I recommend is local images. Forget the spoofing. I mean, don't forget it. Let, let me just say this. Nothing works better than when you take the image at the location, around the location, around the geographical area, around the, the, the centroid of the business, uh, extending out about 10 miles, 10, 20, you can extend to 20. Local images, local images. Google gets so much information, guys. They even get the, like, the altitude that you are, the wind speed is sometimes on, on, on those images. Google gets all that information and they have the satellite info, right? Because they're tracking you. They know where the fuck you are. Put it on airplane mode. It doesn't matter. They track you. Yeah. Google knows where the fuck you are, man. So you're giving them all that information and you're making relevant to the lo location. Next best is trying to spoof the information, but make sure that they're locally relevant images, not just any image, but locally relevant, which I showed how to do in local GMB Pro. Well, that was done a couple of years ago. Might, might be time for an update for local GMB Pro. Yeah. It's working really well anyway. Like I hate update, updating something that works just to say, just to update it and, and sell it more expensive. At any rate, if you have to spoof it, the idea is getting the info into the Google database. What Google do, does with that image after, it doesn't matter because we're giving them the, the, the information. And you're making it relevant because you're placing it in your GMB. And hopefully you're doing it right because you're doing it multiple ways, not only one way, because there's no GMB that's legit that only gets images one way. Yeah. All right, so, so you have to take all of these things into account when you're spoofing images instead of trying to talk the clients into uploading images and uh, whoever comes to the client's business or wherever the, the client goes to a job to take, take pictures and upload video, upload image, all of these different things that are natural looking, a natural looking GMB, should, how it should look, how it should behave, the things that it should get, right? So... When you get that anal about it, whether exit data is there or not, we can show whether it is. I'm not going to do it here, but we can show whether it is. You, you, you can go take a look and see if the exit data is there or not. But it, it, once again, it doesn't matter. And if you're spoofing the data and, and you can upload local images, then you're doing yourself and or your clients a disservice by not taking local images, not hiring someone to do it. Because it works so much better. I can't tell you how much better it works. I mean, I, I could show you. I'm not going to do it here. But I mean, we, I get results in GMB. Like, like, like it's the simplest thing yeah. in the world. But it's because it's done right. And, and you can hire somebody on Craigslist just to take images for very inexpensive. I know because in my real estate business, one of the areas that I was flipping a property in, uh, a piece of vacant land in, required... In order to be in the MLS, it required actual photos from the property, not like aerial photos. Like most everywhere else that I sell properties, I can just use Google satellite images as the property photos, and that's fine. But this one particular property, this county, uh, the MLS in that area required that there was photos taken of the property and from the property. And so I just posted an ad on Craigslist in that area and said, I'll pay $30 for somebody to go out and snap half a dozen photos from their camera, their, their phone. They don't even need it. You know, it don't, you don't need to be a photographer, just anybody snap from their phone, six images. I'll pay 30 bucks. And I had like 18 people reply to me <laughs> in a matter of an hour. It was insane. <laughs> and so, and I hired this one, this one girl, uh, it was all done via email, um, uh, you know, from the Craigslist ad. And within 45 minutes, I had my six photos and I ended up paying her like I gave her a $10 tip uh, via PayPal. So I paid her 40 bucks because um, I had it so quickly. And so again, you guys, it's very inexpensive. You can get people to do that for you. I think Marco used a bike courier at one time. 
<laughs> so, and that's somebody can make money on, you know, an additional income doing their, their job. You know what I mean? So again, there's a lot of ways that you can get those local images if you can't get the uh, business owner to contribute. So Courier, Uber, people, people going back and forth from work, people uh, commuting back and forth. I use it all. I use, it all works. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and by the way, Essie, I think you're, you've got some job security in the future because it sounds like local GMB pro might be the next thing on the block to be uh, updated. So you might have to learn local GMB pro too. <laughs> All right. I'm all ready for everything now. Uh, one there step at a time though. <laughs> there you go. All right. So the next question is from my love Gabe uh, it says, hello everyone. My question is, is there a limit to the amount of power a link can have? Is it capped or can we send an infinite amount of GSA spam to a G, G site, for instance, and get more and more link juice. That was kind of like what you already answered, Marco. You want to kind of re revisit that uh, a bit? A link, the most power that a link can have is from an infinite page rank 10 website. And the only infinite page rank 10 website that I know of is Google. It's capped at page rank 10, of course, because it's in the algorithm. It's in, it's in the the what do you call it the page rank patent that was incorporated into the ranking score patent right so we know that's the cap now can you can you send an infinite amount of gsa spam to a g site and get more yes of course you can but why what's the yeah. point and see I, when people ask this and this is this is i, I love bb for this because he asks this type of question my question is always why would you do that we know that tiered link building the way that Dedia does it at mgyb.co, the way that he does it works perfectly well with what we do because we worked it in conjunction, conjunction with him. He and I have, and Bradley and, and everyone in the crew, we sat down with Dedia and talked to him about the link building. This is how we want it. And, and, and then he has come up with his own flavor on how it should be done to the point where it just goes hand in hand. You're supposed to get the SEO shield and get Dedia's link building so that you see what the results are from that. So now what you do is you look at your analytics, you look at your search console, and you should know where your money, where the money is in your niche and what the money keywords are in your niche. So you start tracking those and then you start targeting those, but you're never going to send an infinite amount of links at those because th that's easy to spot. Infinite link building, the way that, the way that, that you're talking about. You never want to do that. You want to do it tiered. You want to have link building cycles to different properties yeah. so that everything, so that your entire entity, your, your, your entire thing on the web is constantly getting juice. It's con constantly getting powered up. And so you're constantly ranking for new keywords in your niche because of all the power that you're accruing, which is really page rank and ranking score, what you're accruing. And of course, it's all powered up. All right. So once you've done all this, if you have no people coming to your website, which I don't see how you could have no people, but if you've got no people coming to your website, or if the people that are coming to, to your website are not taking action, meaning that they're not closing the deal, whatever it is that you set for them to do, then you've got a big problem because you will not sustain the, the rankings that you have. This is all attended upon you getting a real person into your website and that person doing whatever it is that you set for them to do, whether it's filling out a form, watching a video, uh, downloading a PDF, download uh, whatever it is that you've set for them to do so that Google can see the final piece of the puzzle, which is that person trusting you enough to click on whatever you have to give you their information, to give you their money, whatever it is. I mean, you could build links, infinite links, that if, and if people don't eventually come and take action, you're going to be in a whole lot of trouble because Google is going to get signals other than what you're sending them. You're sending them great signals because you're getting all of this page rank and ranking score, but then there's no one taking action. And you don't want to do that. There's no you don't validation. You want to create that, that scenario. There's no entity validation. Yeah. Of course. No validation. Yep. I totally agree. All right. So there's a wall of text here from Org. Uh, <clears throat> typically, we ask not to post this much because it's difficult to read through. But since we don't have a lot left, we'll go ahead and run through it. Question is, uh, by the way, and there's a comment that says, fantastic approach using Essie for the rework. Good move, all of you. So Essie, you've, you've got some fans already. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. 
So Org says, hello, I have a couple of GMB listings for towing services. They are spammy listings within a county. Lately, I have been creating listings and as soon as I verify the listings, they are automatically getting suspended. When I contact Google to reinstate the listings, they want proof of business license or utility bill showing my business name and address. Is anyone else having this problem when creating listings or is it just the towing industry? Well, first of all, I do know that the towing industry is one of the spammier niches uh, and it has been for years when it comes to GMBs. So that was already a sensitive industry for GMB suspensions. Um, that as well as there's a number of them, overhead garage doors or overhead doors, they call them. Um, you know, there's a number of them that have been, uh, that are like payday loans would be another one, right? Those are really spammy type listing things. that Locksmith. People, yeah, locksmith things, uh, locksmiths as well. So I know towing is one of those that are particularly sensitive for, to suspensions. Um, but that said, also just right now, period, it's difficult to spam GMB listings to create spammed GMB listings, period. Um, it's just across the board in any industry. doesn't mean it can't still be done, but they are very sensitive right now. I know because I just had a couple of them delivered that I ordered way back in June and they were just finally delivered a couple of weeks ago. I went in and cleared the uh, physical address because it was a service area business. I cleared the serv the physical address as per Google's terms, right? <laughs> because it was a service area business and it was showing the physical address in the verified GMB. So I went in to clear the physical address to remove it from uh, the street address from pub being published. And as soon as I did that and click save, it instantly suspended it. So, and it was in the tree service industry. So uh, again, I, you know, it's, it, it is a problem right now, which is why a lot of people aren't offering verified GMBs right now where you can purchase verified, you know, spammed GMB listings um, because of that reason. And remember, Google is trying to combat spam GMB listings. And one of the thing, one of the ways they're doing it is they're just like algorithmically automatically suspending things that are making edits or that it determines as like, again, with towing industries, that being one of the more sensitive ones. The moment you verify it or make a change or an edit, boom, it gets suspended. And then they require you to go through that process of providing documentation that that, that a that business physically resides in the location that you tried to verify. And that's just their way of reducing spam. Um, and so in my opinion, I would, you know, I wouldn't bother trying to reinstate those. If you know it's a spam listing and it gets suspended, start over, try again. Um, and in towing, I don't know that you're going to have any success right now. So any comments on that? Nah, Google's trigger happy right now, man. They they they're killing everything. Yep. <laughs> everything they can. You stick your head out, you're liable to get shot. I always tell people, right? Someone's got an AK-47 and they're firing. The thing to do is never let's look and see who's shooting. Yeah. Because you're gonna get shot. The thing, duck, you <laughs> duck, man. Duck and and, and 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 don't stick your head out. It doesn't matter who's shooting. Somebody's shooting, man. That's, that, that's the important thing. Oh, let me see who's shooting. Boom, right? You get it between the eyes. That's what's happening right now. You go change stuff, and sometimes it's just posting versus not posting for a while. That'll get you. And then uh, uh, making changes and not making changes. And then adding images, not adding images. It's going really crazy right now. And, of course, their idea is anyone who doesn't have a real business it isn't going to call us or if they do they can't provide the paperwork right to reinstate their business so fuck it we just kill them and and then we'll worry about whether they can they can uh get their suspension lifted some some other way but right now i mean that it, that's just the way it is i, I know that, that that there's some ways to create these uh spammy lists but if you have i mean if, if it's your towing business or if it's a client's towing business then get a legitimate listing man so the follow-up question is also with towing services. Do you think I should build up every listing or should I focus on having a lot of listings in the County and hope that proximity does its thing? Okay. I know from experience that having too many GMBs in close proximity to each other will pigeon, they'll, they'll filter themselves out. They won't even appear in maps. It's not that they're, they get de-indexed or suspended. They just won't show in maps. So there, there's, there really is a, there can be too many, too close to each other that where they start to cancel each other out, literally Google will filter those out. Um, so I don't recommend that if you're going to do multiple GMBs, you have to have, and, and, and it varies. Um, it could vary by industry. I don't know, but I know it very like the, the, how close they can be together varies uh, before they start getting filtered out. Um, 
what I would recommend is a minimum of 10 miles uh, between each, but it depends on what type of, with the towing business, the service area is generally fairly large for a towing business, uh, at least from what I understand. And so therefore it wouldn't make sense to have two that are only 10 miles apart, right? It would be, it would, it would probably be more natural to have two that were, you know, 30 miles apart or something like that, right? Or 40 miles apart because towing businesses by their nature are service area businesses that typically have a fairly large service area, right? So I would recommend that if you were going to do multiple GMBs, that they would be spread out in a strategic way, but far enough apart to where they don't cause any filtering issues. Um, but that said, because of the fact that GMBs are so sensitive right now to, to suspension, um, you're better off having what you do have that's verified and valid or that you know has some uh, age to it, right? Um, building that up, which is what local GMB Pro teaches. We teach exactly how to how to really get the most exposure and um, expand your maps footprint, so to speak, with uh, local GMB pro methods. And that's the better way to go because there's more longevity, in my opinion, with those than having multiple GMBs that, especially when they're brand, you know, newly registered GMBs that are very um, trigger happy or suspension happy, right? It's very prone to suspension. So I would recommend that you take some that may, might have some, um, you know, some tenure, so to speak, right, that have been around for a bit, that have some age to them, some authority, they're less likely to be suspended. And you can do more with those, in my opinion. I think that's the smarter long-term route to go. That's my opinion. Mark, it would, it would say you. Absolutely. Especially if these are, are, if this is my business, my tow trucks, my drivers, man, you could do so much damage with that. You could have all of, oh, fuck. You could have all of those people extending your centroid left and right. I mean, I'm, I'm serious. And, and, and then you, you hook up those posts the right way and then you do your press releases again the right way and then hit it with link building. And it, it, it's, it's stupid simple. And it's it, the, the results that you're going to get, no, nobody else can because nobody else will be doing what you're doing. So the last question, and then we're going to wrap it up because we're four minutes away from the end of the show anyways, uh, says one more question. I have been using Ghost Browser to log in to log into all of my listings and work on them in different browsers without having to log in and out and use VPNs and such things like that. I know in one of your videos, you said Google doesn't mind all the listings coming from one IP anymore. Do you think Google can one day change their mind and suspend all listings coming from the same IP, for example, if there was too many listings created from one IP? You know, that I don't know. I don't work for Google and I don't know what that uh, threshold may be. I no. mean, it, it's likely that if you're doing, you know, dozens and dozens of GMB verifications from the same IP, even if there's different browsing sessions, like unique Google profiles with different browsing sessions and browsing histories and all of that, and that's what Ghost Browser does, right? It keeps all of that intact. But if it's all coming from the same IP, it, 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 that could that could be a flag that triggers suspension of all of them. I don't know. I don't work for Probably. Google. I can't answer that question. It's logical that that could happen. But I, I will I will bring SE in for, for, for this last this last question because I'm gonna ask her. We went through this. We went through whether to use Browsio, whether to use Ghost Browser, or whether to use uh, Firefox Profile. Firefox session. How how did you solve it? I mean, don't give away what you did, but or exactly how you did it. <laughs> yeah, but how did you solve it? Tricky. Uh, well. Uh, I'm not sure, of course, about the uh, how much it can be triggering to Google if you're doing all these listings. Uh, what is actually the limit of listings? I don't think it will have any impact in the end. Um, Firefox works in a similar way as Ghost Browser with its uh, private profiles. So what it does, it keeps uh, all of your information separated from one browsing session to the other, one login to the other. So, um, but of course, they are all connected to one IP. We're not using proxies anymore, uh, which means that if it's going to trigger uh, some uh, negative uh, impact on Google, it, it will do it anyway. So on the terms of deciding if it's going to be Firefox or Ghost Browser, in my opinion, it will end up being almost the same thing. Uh, for, for his question on in the end, though, I wouldn't actually be sure. I think you guys would be able to give a more certain answer on that. Of course, but but my, my question was, was more 
you work with Firefox, but you're not using proxies, although you could use proxies. I'm not using, yes, I'm not using proxies. Um, I've been using Firefox and uh, the option that it offers with Firefox profiles, and it works basically in the same way that Grove's browser works mm -hmm. with its sections and uh, uh, different, uh, keeping everything uh, separated for, uh, from one, one another. So um, if we're going to compare those two, I would say they work in the same way. Now, if we're going to, to that determine if this way is going to yeah. uh, cause Google to, I don't know, uh, suspend these listings in the end, that is something that I cannot say for, uh, for sure. All right, Essie, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Essie. So there you go. And um, remember, like, you know, Ghost Browser, I think, just adds some convenience, makes it a little bit easier than doing, like, separate Firefox profiles or sessions. Um, but, you know, it can be done manually, too, without the monthly expense. So uh, there you go. And that will be covered in Syndication Academy version 3, thanks to Essie. So yep. thanks, everybody, for being here. Happy Thanksgiving to all those who celebrate it. Thanks, guys, for sticking around. Bye, everyone. And thanks for showing up, Essie. We appreciate that. Thank you. Bye. 